today is one of our very own. Our speaker today is James Lee, a new faculty member in the Department of Physics and Astronomy here at Sonoma State. His experiences before joining us are best summarized as the tale of two states. Uh, his undergraduate degree from uh, UCSB, followed by a trip across the continent for a PhD in Illinois at the University of Havana Champaign, a postdoc back in California at LBL before returning to Illinois for his work as uh, in the laboratory equipment for there, and then finally returning to California to join us here in the faculty. So you've definitely definitely seen the state. Yes. Well, two of the two of the fifty at least. <laughs> so it's wonderful to have you here. And uh, for those physics majors in the room. Thinking forward, you may well be having a lot of your upper division physics classes with James. So, with that in mind, let's give a very warm welcome, especially to our own professor. Thank you. Thanks, Tom, and uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I think it's going to be fun, and uh, I, uh, I hope that's the case because we're about to engage in a tour of my adventures through nanomagnetism and potentially yours as well. Um, so, let me first of all limit my discussion to uh, one particular aspect of magnetism, and that's particularly what happens to electrons and their spins when the space between atoms, uh, in, the, in the venue between atoms, all the, way up to, all the way up to a few hundred nanometers. And that's what I mean by nanomagnetism. And while it may seem small, there's actually a lot going on there. The physics, the basic physics is uh, very interesting. And not only that, it gives you an opportunity to make contact with things they didn't expect to see in materials, whether that be skirmions and notions from high energy physics or completely impossible, uh, theoretically implausible particles. Um, one thing you may note about the affiliations here is that uh, the US Department of Energy shows up. Throughout my entire talk, you're gonna see work that I've done in US uh, Department of Energy facilities using DOE uh, resources. So, so this is very much your tax dollars at work. All right. So when most of us have encountered magnetism in, say, schools or universities, most of us have been limited to pictures of this kind. Uh, uniform slabs of something, may that be a bar magnet or something else, generating a dipole magnetic field. And don't get me wrong, this is not a bad thing to study. As a matter of fact, in the next slide, you'll see why a dipole field is important. However, it doesn't really get at the complexities of how magnetism can manifest in materials. If you're lucky, you might take a materials course or a condensed matter course, and you can see that bar magnets sometimes, what you expect to have, what, the things that you expect to be bar magnets end up not being the case. Um, and this three-step diagram shows you why. Uh, so this, imagine this is your uh, putative bar, uh, bar magnet. One thing to know about a magnetic field is that it takes energy to establish it, and uh, physical uh, systems want to minimize their energies. So what they do, instead of just having a full-blown magnetic field, is to develop what are called magnetic domains. Instead of having a north and a south, it might split into two domains, north-south, south-north, or it might split up into multiple small domains that completely encompasses the magnetic field flux within itself. It lowers the energy thereby, but it results in something that's very boring, something that can't pick up paper clips. And while this is a very simple picture, and perhaps as far as most classroom treatments of magnetism matter go, it's a good thing that it's done because we actually do see it in the laboratory. So this, for example, is a Kerr uh, effect micro, uh, micrograph uh, of magnetic domains that appear in crystal, uh, crystals of iron. In this case, a whisker-like shaped uh, uh, a crystal. But just on top of that is another layer of uh, iron atoms, and in between which is a non-magnetic buffer, mag uh, magnesium oxide. And if you, in case you're wondering what ML means, that means monolayer. In other words, you have atomic layers of man magnesium oxide, and on top of that, atomic layers of uh, iron. And if you switch your perspective from the bulk crystal to what's on top of the crystal, you see that the simple picture drawn in uh, uh, the textbooks of, say, uh, closure domains doesn't obtain. The picture is actually much more complex, random patches appearing throughout the material. 
If you take another iron-containing material, yttrium iron garnet, the picture is even more complicated. It's still a Kerr microscope uh, image, but in the, and in this case, the black and white indicates whether or not the local magnetic moment points up or down. But instead of having patches, you have linear um, magnetic domain structures that wander about uh, as reminiscent of worms, hence the term worm domain. And in this complexity, you can get all sorts of different features that help you connect to other branches of physics or potentially branches of engineering if you're thinking about using magnetic materials for devices. So how do we get complex magnetic textures like the ones we see here? We're at a point in materials engineering where we can lay down individual layers of atoms and depending on how we lay them down, we can also change the relative strengths of various basic, uh, 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 basic interactions. So remember I'm talking about magnetism on the scale of the space between atoms and materials all the way up to a few hundred nanometers. So what, what is important in this case are the properties of electrons and their intrinsic magnetic moments called spin. On the left, it, we depict, I depict um, um, a cartoon picture of how spins interact via dipole fields. As I said, some of the textbook stuff still makes sense and still very useful. Electrons can be thought of as being point particles that occupy separate atoms. And because they don't make contact, the only way they can interfere with each other or interact with each other is via the field, the, the dipole field that they generate. But of course, we're still at small scales, so classical reasoning doesn't always apply. You have quantum mechanical effects. So in the center, you have what's called spin exchange. And what's important about this is that the electrons are not treated as point particles anymore, but instead as being delocalized clouds of probability. Um, in, in quantum mechanics, these are described as being wave functions. So in this very simple example of a hydrogen molecule or a system that seems to have two atoms, one on the left and one on the right, you have electrons centered on each, but they're not perfectly confined to the atomic site. They spread out. And as a result, you either have the electron wave function significantly overlap in the center or completely not overlap. These are called symmetric and anti-symmetric solutions to Schrodinger's equation. But of course, electrons don't just have charge, they have spin, the magnetic moment. And because electrons don't like occupying the same quantum mechanical state at the same time, they may significantly overlap, but that means that significant overlap causes the spins to be opposite to one another. So that way they don't occupy the same quantum state. In this uh, anti-symmetric state where there is no overlap, the electrons are free to have their spins point in the same direction because they don't have to avoid being in the same quantum state. The bottom line is that the way in which uh, um, ele electron wave functions overlap, the basis of chemistry and the way materials, atoms and materials bind together, determine how the electron spins point. And it's all parameterized by this almost illegible <laughs> parameter called J. And the way, you, the way in which you express the energy of the uh, spin interactions is via a, um, a dot product between the spin vectors of the electrons multiplied by the, uh, the, the constant J. So J will be coming back into the discussion later, so just keep that in mind. One step advanced from that is a spin orbit enabled uh, spin exchange. In this case, you have spins on separate atoms, but because they're delocalized in these wave functions, you can imagine them actually taking various different trips throughout different places of a crystal. As a result, it can, um, electrons can momentarily or virtually hop from wherever they're located, an, an atom on the left or the right, to an atom somewhere in between. And if that atom, this red circle, is off of the line, off of the line that connects these two atomic sites, you can have a different type of spin to exchange interaction, a parameterized by the vector d. Whereas the previous exchange interaction is, uh, can be described as a dot product between spins, 
In this case, is a cross product between their spins dotted with this vector d. Um, I can't get more into that because at this point we'd have to start talking about relativistic effects. Ele electrons in materials move at very near the speed of light, which is why this uh, effect occurs. So we have three different uh, potential interactions that we can twiddle around by changing the properties of materials. The dipolar ex uh, interaction, exchange, and spin orbit interactions. So how, how, if you twiddle those knobs, what can happen? In the example over here, we're, we're studying theoretically a system in which the electron spins either point up or down. That's real white and black in, the, in this figure. And in this case, we're changing only the dipolar interaction strength as well as the exchange strength. And depending on how you tune them, you can have patches that are up or down compared to their surroundings. And if you twiddle one knob more than the other, you can get what are called isolated bubbles or little patches of up contrasting, to, uh, contrasting with the down background to an environment in which the bubbles are very densely packed to the point where the bubbles begin to elongate and create stripe-like domains, a lot like what you saw in Yttrium Iron Garden in the previous slide. So that's just dipole and exchange and changing the relative strengths of those two. On the other hand, if you change the relative strengths of exchange and spin-orbit interactions, you can get something called a spin spiral. And you'll see an example of that in a moment. The spin spiral, in this case, causes the electron spin from one atomic plane to another to slowly rotate until it fully executes a turn. And the period of that is expressed as the ratio between the spin exchange constant as well as the magnitude of this uh, spin orbit vector d. As the sine of d also affects how uh, the spin spiral spins, whether or not that goes clockwise or counterclockwise. So you can really change the magnetic properties of the material, especially at the nano scale, just by twiddling three different parameters. So, in principle we can do that, but how would we do that practically speaking? Um, in this case, there are three practical things that we can do to a material in order to change the balance between those three interactions. We could change the morphology, the external shape of the material, we could change the internal crystal structure and the chemicals used to make up that material. So on the bottom left is an example of how to change the morphology and thereby change the dipolar interactions. So this is from a paper, uh, the citation will show up in a second, in which uh, a, a researchers created a film of a magnetic material called permal, an alloy of nickel and iron. And the idea is that they created um, different shapes. The, the, one, the, the, the film segment on the right has the same aspect ratio as a pancake, it's circular and very flat. And then going from right to left, it turns more into a candy bar. Um, you can tell I'm hungry because I'm now thinking in terms of food. <laughs> but you can see how the aspect ratio has changed right to left. In uh, an experimental probe called magnetic force microscopy in which it can directly see how the, the magnetic domain points, at least inside the plane or outside the plane um, of, of their system. Going from right to left, you can see that you, there are light and dark patches appearing. And they, these resemble the closure domains I showed you earlier in the iron whisker, as well as a textbook uh, example of uh, magnetic domains. But watch what happens between this one and this one. This magnetic dot has closure domains, but then you make it a little bit narrower, and more candy bar-like, and all of a sudden, it only has one end that is dark and another end that's light. It went from being having, some, having a closure domain structure to being a bar magnet, a bar magnet on the nanoscale. Why is that potentially important? Well, let's say you make these candy bar-like magnetic dots and put them next to each other. That means they can interact via their magnetic dipole fields. If you change the magnetic dipole moment on one of the dots, you can potentially get the other to move around. 
the researchers here attempted to create a prototype magnetic logic gate by having a series of these magnetic dots located next to each other. And they wanted to see whether or not changing one dot, uh, interacting via the dipole field, can cause the other dot on the other end to flip. The answer was yes. You can also change the crystal structure in order to change the relative proportions of the dipolar exchange and spin orbit interactions. In a natural crystal, in order to change the crystal structure, you have to uh, change the atoms that belong inside the crystal itself. So this is one of the, re this is a small segment of um, the manganese, uh, of manganese psilocyte. This is the repeating motif that appears and is applied to create a, a large extended crystal. If you want to change the crystal symmetry or you want to change the crystal structure, it goes hand in hand with uh, changing the chemistry as well. Manganese can be substituted with something else. Um, notice in this system though that the manganese and the, therefore the electrons located on the manganese ions has a silicon off of the line that connects the two manganese ions. That resembles this diagram. And therefore, just by having this set of chemicals combined in this arrangement, you can have a spin strong spin orbit interaction that causes the uh, electron moments, the spin moments on each uh, manganese site to be canted. Combined with the exchange, you can get a spin spiral, which we'll see in the next slide. If you're not interested in natural crystals, you can produce artificial crystals, or just something that has a regular modulation. In this case, uh, the example I'm using here is a so-called multilayer, or a thin film that is chemically modulated uh, from the bottom up. Um, the labels here are hard to read, but the yellow is cobalt and the gray is palladium. And the idea is it can lay layers down onto a flat substrate and have a magnetic moment spontaneously appear. With one set of cobalt and palladium layers, the magnetization or the magnetic moment of the film might point inside the plane of the film. But the more repeats that you have going up causes the magnetic moment to eventually cant and point straight out. So, yes. James, the, I was just seeing in this picture the spin orbit coupling, which I took to be a generic diagram, yes. is not as generic as I'm thinking. It, it's really telling me what the spins are going to do with this, right. with this third thing offset. That's I, right. I should really be thinking of it as you know, we've got these spin states, and I'm used to always thinking of them as being along one, you know, projected along one axis or something, but. I definitely want to be thinking of this in this yes. two-dimensional plane and seeing them like that. So when I look at atomic structures like in the box on the right, I should be thinking about how, oh, it's changing the orientation of those spins. Right. Okay, thank you. And from one side to the next, the canting of the spin direction might be slight. But over a long extended length, hundreds of nanometers, you'll see the, uh, the electron spins execute a rotation a spin spiral as you saw before. Okay. Yeah. So um, with an artificial crystal as it were, by just changing how the layers are, are, are applied, you can get the magnetic moment of a thin film to either point, uh, point horizontally or vertically. Or by changing the chemical used in the gray layer from say palladium to gadolinium, you can cause the material from, to go from being ferromagnetic in which all the magnetic moments all point in the same direction to being ferrimagnetic, in which there's a net moment in one direction, but you can see that the magnetic moments on the gadolinium uh, layers point in the opposite direction to that of the cobalts. Why is that important? That segues into the first major topic of my talk. In this case, um, the investigation of so-called skirmion topological defects and magnetic thin films. Um, so this will heavily involve twiddling the knobs that control uh, spin exchange and the spin orbit interaction. I'll then later in my talk go on to uh, twiddle just, just the dipolar exchange and, and, um, and create a system in which we can investigate a completely different type of magnetic phenomenon. 
but let's first concentrate on what I'm calling magnetic skirmions. It's an object with an extremely funny name, skirmion, but if we investigate where that name came from, you can see why this was intriguing, at least to me. So the first instance of a skirmion appearing in physics is not magnetic materials or even condensed matter physics. It's actually high energy physics. The idea is that in the 1950s, no one really knew why particles had the properties they did. You know, protons were known to be extremely stable, neutrons relatively so, and the question is, why was that the case? This is an era before in which anyone knew about quarks or quantum chromodynamics, so people were really struggling to figure out why particles had the properties they did. Tony Skirm, that's where the skirmions come from, um, had an idea. What if we created a toy model in which you had just a flat, uniform particle field, and to stand in for the particles that we know exist, we'll put in topological defects into these fields. Why do you choose topological defects as opposed to something else, like a bump in the, uh, in the particle field? In this case, um, let's consider the case of knots and strings as one particular example of topology. And when you tie a knot into a string, it can be particularly difficult to undo the knot. I think we all have experience having knots suddenly appear and trying to undo them. Sometimes as we try to undo them, we can get them to shift back and forth. But unless we really get in and try to change the shape of the, uh, of the string, we can't undo it. The best maybe we can do if we can't undo it is to move it all the way to the end of the string until it disappears. So that's a topological defect in the string. On the other hand, other types of shape defects, like a loop, that doesn't form a knot. Well, it looks complex, but all you have to do is take the ends of the string and just subtly rotate it, rotate them, and then the loop will suddenly disappear. That's a non-topological defect, and making a small change to the string caused it to go away. Well, Tony Skirm had exactly this idea. We're going, to put, we're going to put knots, topological defects, into a particle field and pretend that these things are protons. And he got fairly decent results for using a toy model. The mass of, the, uh, of certain atomic particles, uh, subatomic particles, such as pions, was predicted to within 20%, just from this very simple model. But then quarks came around and everyone completely forgot about Skirm's work until someone working with magnetic materials in the Soviet Union saw a correspondence in the mathematics. The mathematics behind skirmions is very much like the mathematics that describe magnetic materials, especially the ma magnetic moments in materials. And that's how the magnetic skirmion was in principle born. What does a topological defect or a twist looks like, look like in a magnetic material? In this case, uh, in the magnetic material, you're, def you're making a map of how the magnetic moment varies from one point in the material to another. And in order to do that, you need to define several things about um, the magnetic moments from point to point. The magnitude of the magnetic moment, as well as two angles to define the direction of that moment. Well, you can do that completely, and then this is the map of the magnetic uh, magnetization field, or a map of the magnetization moment in, for a material. This is a globe in which there are magnetic moments, vectors, and they all point away from the surface of the globe. And that's what a topological defect looks like in a magnetic material, in, in so-called order parameter space. Well, that's interesting in a mathematical sense, but we exist in real space. You know, uh, microscope images are, you know, are, um, were very, the microscope images I showed you earlier were very illuminating. How do we go from order parameter space to something that we can intuitively understand? Well, if you want to go from order parameter space to real space, you have to perform a, a mapping. In this case, a, stereogra a, stereo uh, a stereographic map from order parameter space to real space. Uh, the physics community calls that skinning the hedgehog because this map has um, spikes coming out of its surface, much like the quills of an angry hedgehog. Um, so if you were to skin that beast, 
you can map it onto a flat surface. The, the, southern, the south pole, the blue arrow, maps onto one point, which is the center of a skirmion. On the other hand, the north pole, the part um, of a skirmion defect that points up, doesn't get mapped to any one particular point, but to an infinite number of points. The north pole gets mapped onto infinity. Because very far away from the topological defect, they should just point in one direction. It's only dead in the center of your defect, they should all only point dead. So that's how the mapping occurs. You skin the hedgehog, you spread it, and stretch the skin until you have this topological uh, defect in the magnetization field. To go back to the analogy of a loop versus a knot in a string, let's compare two different so-called me uh, magnetic textures or spin textures. On the right is the skirmion defect. And if you take a cross section from left to right of its spin map, you can actually see the, or you can conceptualize what the knot in the spin texture is. Going from left to right, you have red upward pointing arrows, and then suddenly it begins to change color, uh, corresponding to the fact that it's tilting to the left. Then as you go from left to right, it goes all the way down, then back up again, executing one full turn. So that's how the topological defect, the knot in the magnetization vector um, manifests as a spin texture in a skirmion. Contrast that with what I'm going to compare to the loop, which is um, historically called a magnetic bubble. Superficially, it looks very much like a skirmion. It has a center that points down, surrounded by spins that point up, and something in between, the green border, in which um, the spin and the, and the spin of the border seems to undergo a rotation as well. A magnetic bubble may superficially look like a skirmion, but it's missing several essential ingredients. For example, um, it may have exchange, but not a spin orbit interaction that requires the spins to have a coherent rotation in one way or another. As a result, if I try to uh, change one spin at a time from, say, down to up, or sideways to up, going from the top line down, you can see that I'm flipping the spins from sideways to up, make converting a green to a red arrow. And I can just very smoothly eliminate the blue arrows until the, the magnetic bubble completely goes away, shrinks away to zero. That's the equivalent of just twisting a string. On the other hand, because a skirmion is, requires spin exchange as well as um, spin orbit interactions to exist, I try, I try to rotate one spin and just causes all the rest to stiffly rotate in response. So if I twist um, a spin trying to get it to disappear, it just shifts to the left, or to, in this case, to the right. The top, this, this reveals one of the important features of a, a topological magnetic defect. It's extremely difficult to just make it go away from small changes to the magnetization. And that, practically, that has potential practical applications. Say, for example, we had a skirmion in the magnetic material, and you were to drive it from, say, left to right using an electric current. With a bubble, it might get caught on this structural defect and then shrink away to nothing or just stay there. That should play. Oh, cannot play media. That's the beauty of PowerPoint. So on the other hand, if this were a skirmion, you, what you would have seen is the skirmion hitting that defect, rolling underneath it, and continuing on out of the frame of view, just like in the camera. So if you made a magnetic circuit in which you could move these skirmions around as memory bits, you could store them in a corral, and when necessary, recall them and have them read off of a magnetic read head and then send it back to where it came from, destroy it, or modify it in some way. It, it's inspiring in the sense that you can use the properties, the topological properties of magnetic domains to potentially create um, a technology. Skirmions and their topological twists also endow with very interesting uh, uh, transport properties. Other than being able to dodge um, 
chemical or structural defects, electrons that travel through these uh, topological swirls end up being deflected and creating what's called a Hall effect. So if you've studied electricity and magnetism, either at the lower or upper division, you've probably encountered this idea. If not, you will soon. The idea is that when you have electrons flowing in a current through a conductor and you apply a magnetic field to it, depending on the sign of, the, of those uh, electrical charge carriers, they'll all go to one side or another side of the conductor. And because it, they all move to one side, it creates a voltage across the direction of the current and, and perpendicular to that of the magnetic field as well. Even though you don't have an implied magnetic field, if you have a skirmion and, and electrons traveling through, you can get this effect to occur. And that's the case because the, uh, the magnetic moment of an electron, as it moves, as the electron moves through a skirmion spin texture, has to continuously follow the spin texture of the skirmion. And executes as a result, and the spin as a result executes a full turn. Well, that turn ends up having the same effect as an applied magnetic field. And that causes the electric, electrical current flow to uh, deflect, causing the Hall effect um, associated particularly to the topology of its skirmion spin texture. But at the same time, because you're conserving momentum, you're kicking um, uh, electrical current in one direction, you're causing your skirmions to also deflect in the other. So there is a topological Hall effect and a skirmion Hall effect. This, this effect is what's also known as a spin transfer torque. You send an electrical current through a material and cause your magnetic spin texture to rotate or otherwise move. And people have demonstrated that, demonstrated that with bubbles, but the theory indicates that skirmions can be moved with a much smaller uh, electrical uh, current density than bubbles. As a matter of fact, five orders of magnitude lower than that of bubbles and conventional ferromagnets. So what so some of the properties that damned uh, conventional magnetic memory back in the 60s and 70s are completely eliminated by, uh, by the properties of the skirmion. It revives the notion of creating not electronics, but magtronics to create devices such as memory bits or pro possibly uh, processors. So all those effects in themselves are interesting to me. But I'm an experimentalist. I like to know that something actually exists before I pay attention to it, or that it could exist for me to look for it. In this case, someone beat me to it already. All the things I mentioned before were just twinkles in someone's eyes before 2019. But from that point on, when the experimental team in Germany found skirmions in the material, the race was on to actually prove that skirmions had these properties and to actually use them in devices. And the first material it was found in was manganese psilocyte, which again has not just spin exchange, but also a strong spin orbit interaction. Which, and that combination of interactions causes the magnetization to do interesting things, such as, for example, a helicoid uh, spin texture in which by applying a magnetic field onto a material, you can get the uh, magnetic moment to uh, rotate from one atomic plane to another. Or a cone-like uh, pattern in which the uh, magnetic moments, the spins, partially point along the applied, direction, <coughs> applied field direction, but also ro rotate around that uh, magnetic field direction as well. So a conical and a helicoidal uh, spin texture. I went into detail to describe them because that's what appears in this uh, phase diagram in which we map the magnetic properties of a manganese psilocyte against the temperature in the horizontal axis and uh, apply magnetic, magnetic field along the vertical axis, uh, axis. So you'll note this, all this occurs at very low temperatures, under 30 Kelvin. But once you can get below that temperature, a whole wealth of things happens. At moderate magnetic fields, you have the helicoidal spin texture appear. You increase the magnetic field at low temperatures, you can go to conical, and then eventually the field becomes so strong just makes all the spins point along the direction of the field. But 
between 27 and 30 Kelvin, there is a little bit of a roadblock that for decades was unknown. It was clear that something was going on because the uh, various different thermodynamic properties of the material were changing. Um, a, sp a specific heat, for example, and the magnetization. And there were clear boundaries to the, this region which people ended up calling the A phase. Not for any particular reason, just ended up having that name. Mobauer and company in Germany decided, well, could a skirmion be appearing here? Who knows why they thought that, but they investigated. And it turned out that that was the case. And I'll, I'll explain exactly what they saw. But before I do, I want to explain something basic about their uh, measurement method. It's what's called a, a neutron diffraction. Not all of you may have seen diffraction at work. So what I'm going to do is demonstrate how it works using this mesh. And there's an example of what that looks like there as a square mesh of, of wires. In this case, this is extremely fun. You can barely see that it has a texture. What Mollbauer and company do is essentially send a beam of neutrons. This is a laser, but pretend it's a neutron source through their material, not a, not a net, but a crystal of silica, a manganese silicide. And what they got was a diffraction pattern, just like I'm getting with the laser and this mesh. You can see that this square mesh produces a, a pattern of, uh, of points that are distributed over a square lattice. Knowing that the points are over a square lattice may not tell you that you have a square mesh, but it does tell you that things are arranged in a square fashion. If the magnetic texture in manganese silicide does something different from that of a helicoid or a cone, they'll have a very different, uh, like in such, such as they suspected would happen in the A phase, then whatever diffraction pattern they get from this beam of neutrons will change. So if, if the pattern, if the diffraction pattern through this suddenly changed on you after I say blue on it, you would suspect that something happened to the structure. That's the exact same kind of reasoning that they used. So this is a neutron diffraction pattern. And the, here's a schematic of their experiment. So they have a cylindrical crystal of manganese silicide, and they have neutrons coming in from left to right. They're applying a magnetic field on the, on the sample, and then having the neutrons pass through the crystal and then diffract. Question. Yes. Are the neutrons monoenergetic? Yes. They're monoenergetic, and they're what are called thermal neutrons, which means that they had roughly 20 to 25 MeV via kinetic energy just slow enough to make it through the material and interact with something. And the reason why neutrons were so interesting to them is because neutrons don't have an electrical charge, so they won't interact with the electrical charge of the electrons or the nuclei. On the other hand, neutrons have a small magnetic moment attached to them. So they'll, via dipole interactions, interact with the magnetic uh, moment of the electrons in this material. And then I'll give you a pattern like this. This pattern is from the helicoidal state down here. And you can see that the helicoid produces diffraction spots. That's what these red spots are. Red indicates a high neutron count. Blue indicates a zero neutron count. And they tend to go along certain directions defined by the crystal structure. As they warm the system up, from the helical through the conical into the A phase, however, something happened. Note where this uh, peak is. It's along the so-called 111 direction. Here's the 111 direction. Then as soon as they go into the A phase, there's not a peak anymore. Instead, there are six peaks, and they all seem to be shifted. If you know about Fourier transforms, here's also something else. You notice these blobs in between these main peaks? Well, they weren't there before. The diffraction pattern changed. It, had, it has six peaks shifted in direction, and it has so-called higher order peaks located here, here, 
and if they waited long enough to count enough neutrons, it would appear in every location that I'm indicating. That's, that's a sign that it, the magnetic texture changed from that of a conical uh, phase to something else, which they suspected was from a skirmion state. Another question. Yes. The advantage of using neutrons is they interact with the magnetic properties. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, unlike, say, visible light or X-rays, like I used, and I'll have to explain later, um, neutrons don't interact with the electrical charge, just the magnetic moment. One of the predictions f from uh, skirmion theory is that if you point your magnetic field in some random direction, the skirmions will also form and conf conform to the direction of the magnetic field that you point. It doesn't have to go along special directions, in other words. So they pointed their magnetic field in some random direction, and they still saw the same pattern. So that's interesting. The spin texture chain. But there are also transport properties, like this topological Hall effect that they had to demonstrate um, in order to really say that this spin texture was due to skirmions appearing. And that's what they did here. While they were taking the neutron diffraction uh, data, they were also sending electrical pulses through in order to measure the what in order to measure a Hall effect, and they did. It's a very small effect. Uh, the the Hall resistivity is measured in nano ohm centimeters. That's a very small unit indeed. And for having a very s sensitive measurement with large error bars, you can see that the predicted Hall resistivity came really darn close to the measured resistivity, 10% or so. Not bad for a sensitive measurement. So in 2009, all this work occurred, and suddenly a new field, a, uh, the field of skirmion science, was born. And since then, people have been thinking about whether or not skirmions appear in something other than natural crystals. That's where I come in. Um, back in 2013, 2014, when I became a postdoc at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, we came across an interesting th magnetic thin film, um, a multi-layer of iron and gadolinium. The multi-layer structure is very, um, very, um, th multi-layer blocks are very thin indeed. The A with the circle stands for angstroms, that's 10 to the negative 10 nanometers. And the idea is that someone in UC, uh, uh, UC San Diego was able to grow these multi-layers in such a way to create a film with a, a, a perpendicular magnetic moment. But what, what happens when you cool it down? What happens when you apply a magnetic moment on it? And that was a challenge they gave us, and we rose to it. Before I describe what I, what I and my fellow collaborators did, let me describe for you how the people at UC San Diego grew this, because it's a method called DC magneton, magnetron sputter. And as it turns out, we in Sonoma State have a sputtering machine, not quite a DC magnetron sputtering machine, but the principles basically obtained. What you're seeing here is a metal target. It could be iron or gadolinium. And the idea is that we want to slam uh, individual uh, atoms of some large radius gas, say atomic radius gas like argon, into this material. When you do that, uh, atoms and molecules from the target sputter out and then travel every which way. Some of it will end up on the so-called substrate, uh, which is where our sample lies. Will this play? Oh, it will. Fantastic. This blue object is an electron. Free electrons just spontaneously appear. And the idea is that there's a magnetic field these, what, that's what these uh, pale lines are, on, that cause the, the electrons to concentrate over the surface of the target. Then, when the electrons meet argon uh, atoms, there's enough kinetic energy to ionize them. And then an electric potential between the target and the substrate causes the argon ions to collide into the, sp the sputtering target. So here's the animation again. The electrons uh, trapped by the magnetic field whizzing around. Here's an unsuspecting argon ion about to be hit. 
bang, we have an ionized argon ion being dragged down to the substrate, and you saw some substrate atoms make it to the substrate. You do that often enough, you can create a monolayer uh, of some material. You do that over and over, you get the sample. Yes? What scale is that experiment on? Like how large? Um, sputtering chambers, so the distance between a sputtering target and the substrate can be about this large, about eh, 10 to 15 centimeters or so. It could be wider, for example, if you want a more uniform film. Um, but they vary. The one we have, or the sputtering chamber we have, the distance between the target and the substrate is maybe seven centimeters. Um, it can come in all sorts of form factors. So this is, that's how they created this multi-layer target, uh, multi-layer uh, uh, substrate, uh, multi-layer sample. Sorry about that. Since I worked at the Advanced Light Source, which is um, a giant X-ray generating machine at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, our natural inclination was to just shoot it with X-rays, which is what we did. In this case, not the X-rays you might encounter in a dental lab, but uh, X-rays with energy 10 to 20 times lower than what you might see in, in a medical setting. And that's what goes from left to right. That's what this green beam represents. And the idea is we can tune the energy or the wavelength of those x-rays in order to probe the magnetic state of either iron or gadolinium. Tuning the energy for, say, iron and gadolinium and sending the x-ray beam through causes a diffraction pattern to be captured downstream of the beam onto a CCD camera. We change the temperature of the sample, as well as the applied magnetic field. That's what's on the horizontal temperature and vertical uh, of this uh, axis of this phase diagram. And we saw the ma magnetic texture change via, the ch via changes in the, uh, the X-ray diffraction pattern. At low magnetic fields, for example, we always saw a series of peaks arranged in a line. And that's consistent with uh, a, a grading, a series of lines arranged in a uniform fashion. As we increase the magnetic field, however, the diffraction pattern changed. At room temperature, it went from this to being, well, what we call the skirmion phase. It has this nice six-fold pattern with higher order diffraction peaks, consistent with that of a uh, skirmion labs. But as you lower the temperature of the sample, say at 250K, something appear, a new phase appears between the stripe and skirmion phases. And that's what's depicted here. The change of the diffraction pattern as you go from a low to high magnetic field. In this case, you can see a transition from a stripe. You had now have uh, peaks off of the main axis of the stripe pattern. As you continue increasing the magnetic field, it becomes more of a six-fold pattern. And just before the estate collapses at the extreme limit of the, uh, the skirmion phase, you can see it has a very nice six-fold pattern associated with that. We use that information to figure out what the internal parts of the skirmion were. Because what we notice is that unlike the uh, diffraction pattern collected by Mollbauer over in Germany, the diffraction pattern was not symmetric. This set of peaks, for example, were very bright compared to, say, this row of peaks or this row of peaks. That asymmetry suggested that we didn't just have single symmetrically round skirmions, but they were instead, uh, they either had uh, internal components to it or they were um, somehow elongated or something of this nature. So what we did was we took our data, we found how many X-ray counts were under each peak and that's what the diameters uh, um, represent here. Instead of seeing actual data, uh, we have circles with diameters proportional to the number of X-ray counts in the peak. And then we tried to model this by simulating how the magnetic texture looked in real space. We tried various different configurations. Um, guided somewhat by theoretical calculations, but mostly by pure inspiration. And then ultimately what we found is that 
this real space model, in which you have two downward parts surrounded by an upward background, produces this model pattern that corresponds very well to the data that we saw. It has the same asymmetry, for example, um, and the six, same six-fold pattern. We interpret this as meaning that we don't have single skirmions arranged in a hexagonal lattice, but instead we have two skirmions with the center here and here arranged in a regular fashion to give us this, this diffraction pattern. And what that revealed is that even if you have skirmions appearing in the material, and we did go on later in this paper to demonstrate that these were indeed skirmions as opposed to some other magnetic entity. What we found is that even though they can form, they don't always necessarily form as individual skirmion defects. They can sometimes form aggregates, things that and provocatively described, um, can be provocatively described as, say, a hydrogen molecule. So there's a lot to do in terms of skirmion science. And a lot of open questions. And, we, this, and this is one of the questions that we opened. When skirmions form, do they form individually or do they, or do they clump up? Other researchers have different approaches to doing this. We look at diffraction. Other people like looking at real space images. And so what I'm going to do is, since it's uh, 4.50, I'm going to end my talk at this point, having only talked about skirmions. The idea is that some people are able to move magnetic uh, spin textures using an electrical uh, current. And then, depending on how you squeeze uh, these spin textures through various constrictions, say here, is a very small wire. Uh, these large wires shrink down to a small constriction. Where is my mouse? Hmm. Well, what you would have seen are these long magnetic domains, these worm-like domains moving from left to right. And when they do, they break up into these small skirmion-like magnetic textures. So whereas we just applied a magnetic field to cause skirmions to form in a thin film, others can force um, magnetic domains to break apart and form skirmions in that fashion. The idea is that if you have multiple ways of creating skirmions, you have multiple ways of creating skirmion-based devices. And, or, and if you can create skirmions easily, you can easily uh, uh, characterize their properties, not just with x-rays, but also, in this case, with, um, well, this is actually still x-rays. They, they, uh, they rastered x-rays over a magnetic material in order to get light in dark areas, in order to make the, make the movie that I would have shown you if it had actually played. So, um, so the result is that by changing the, the basic properties of materials, by manipulating the spin exchange as well as the spin orbit, uh, spin orbit exchange strength, you can get various different types of skirmion patterns to form. Um, um, as, um, as I showed in, in the case of a magnetic thin film multilayer, or in the, um, or in this uh, nanostructure, and by chemically changing the multilayers or structures by adding, say, platinum and iridium, you can go from having a, a very dilute uh, state in, in which skirmions are very widely spaced apart to having them densely form. So just by twiddling the parameters for materials, you can get skirmions to appear in various different ways. Um, and what I hope I did was I gave you an idea of different ways people can uh, characterize materials and what can be done at the cutting edge of material science. So that's all my time. So I'll let you ask me questions if you want, or otherwise we can call it a day.
right, so thank you kindly. Uh, we obviously have some time before our five o'clock uh, dismissal of those for extra credit, so let's have some questions from the audience. So what's the first material you're going to work on once you get your layout going? Uh, the first material I want to look at is, well, actually there are quite a few, and they can be generally described as toxic rock candy. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a chemical reaction that you might typically find in the earth with toxic materials at elevated temperatures, potentially high pressures, in order to create a magnetic salt. And these magnetic salts can um, exhibit well, the second topic of my talk, which I didn't get to, which is magnetic frustration. If you cool magnetically frustrated uh, materials low enough with a high enough applied magnetic field, you can get them, you can get them to exhibit pretty wild uh, quantum phenomena, such as uh, spin entanglement. Um, I have different ways of probing that as well, not just x-rays. But that's really my next focus, to create crystals that, are, that have magnetic properties worth looking at. So I, I, I know you're pursuing a, a particular laser that you need for your, for your lab environment. As I saw this, I saw what you could probe with um, a source of neutrons and what you can probe with, with x-rays. Yes. So the x-ray source would, was, is one you have access to in the Bay Area. The um, neutron source, I'm not aware of if you're, um, if you're interested in, in pursuing that. Yeah. Uh, but if you could talk about the, the, how, how you use lasers to probe these materials. Sure. And just to compare these different light sources or, um, or, or um, sources of uh, probing beams, um, X-rays are generated at uh, Lawrence Berkeley in giant electron storage rings. They're literally the size of buildings. The electrons whiz around quite near the speed of light, and whenever you change the direction of an electron trajectory, you get uh, radiation uh, x-rays that we use for diffraction. Neutron sources tend to be in what CSU, in states the CSU doesn't want, want us to go to, it's, uh, places like Tennessee. Um, the, um, and they're also similarly large facilities. On the other hand, the laser I want to buy and use to characterize magnetic materials can fit on the top of a table. And this is, the, um, uh, this is a schematic of what I want to do. So what we're seeing here is a place where a sample would go. I would change the temperature using apparatus not shown here, or apply a magnetic field using the electromagnet shown here as a yoke surrounding the sample. And the idea is I would send a laser beam in and then see how the polarization of the laser beam changes as a function of applied magnetic field, which would indicate that the magnetic, uh, the magnetization field of this film or crystal is changing as well. So that's what these polarizers are for, to set a definite incident <coughs> polarization and then to analyze the outgoing polarization. And you can potentially get things like this. You can track how the polarization or the lepticity of the light changes as a function of magnetic field. And if there are little kinks in this uh, so-called hysteresis loop, we can part the, uh, park the magnetic field at that point and then see how light comes in and see whether or not the visible light coming off of the sample has a correlation associated with it. So I know it's past time, but let me just quickly go through this slide. I'm interested in knowing whether or not the photon count is correlated because, like this video will just play, cannot play. Okay, so the idea is that if something changes in the scatterer, the speckle pattern of laser light coming off also changes in time. If, this is, if nothing moves here, if the scatterers, like the magnetic moments, are absolutely static, the speckle pattern coming off of this sample would also be static as well. But if it changes in time, we can use the correlations in the, in the photon counts in order to characterize, say, um, a time, a characteristic time to the dynamics of the magnetization, or depending on how the correlations decay with time, what kind of, uh, um, what kind of dynamics the magnetic domains or spin textures are engaged in. So it's a simple tabletop experiment, expensive but simple, and we can use the idea of correlating photon counts in order to get at the magnetic uh, dynamics of the material. Thank you.
All right, as we're at five o'clock, uh, those of you who have extra credit are welcome to the part. Uh, please do so as quietly as you can, and we'll take further questions from the speaker. But before we all go, let's have one more round of applause. Thank you.